Welcome back to Law and Crime. I'm Ashley Willicott. I just had the honor of being here as a guest and now I'll be hosting. And we are going to be talking about testimony that's been presented in the case. Now this again is Iowa versus Stanley Liggins. This is a case that we're in day seven of trial and Dennis Kern, who's the criminalist, who is actually offering his live testimony. He is still serving as a witness. He was able to be here and available as a witness so they don't have to do readback of prior testimony, has been um, tested. Now, here's what's interesting to me, is they've been testifying about the fact that none of the evidence collected at the scene, at the ballpark, close to the school, in the defendant's car, none of that has had any DNA or hair fiber evidence linking the defendant to this particular victim. So it's really been an interesting exercise to say none of that evidence exists. But here's going to be my question for our guest. Thank you for joining us today as my guest here. Thank and you for having me. Yes. <laughs> tell us, so when the defense hears testimony to say, hey, there's no hair evidence, there are no fibers, no DNA, what do you do with that as a defense? How does that play into the case? Sure. So let's just think about this case uh, in a whole. It's really a case built on circumstantial evidence. So when you have testimony coming from this criminalist basically saying there's no forensic evidence directly linking ligands to this crime, you let that play out. Uh, we were talking off camera about, you know, the defense isn't really raising any objections here. Well, why would you if you were a defense attorney? You want to let that testimony play out, and when it's time uh, to be up at bat at summation, you're going to hit that home to the jury. The lack of forensic evidence, the lack of direct evidence, this is a circumstantial case. My client didn't do it. Excellent point. I think that's what we're going to look forward to see how the defense handles it, and it sounds like that might be the right way. We are going to return to witness testimony in this case now, again in Iowa versus Stanley Liggins. And welcome back to Law and Crime. We are still showing the Iowa versus Stanley Liggins trial. This is the trial in which he's been accused of murdering a nine-year-old, uh, raping her, murdering her, dousing her with gasoline, lighting her on fire, and then she was found near the Davenport School. Right now we are hearing testimony from Antonio Holmes. He is a witness who was at a liquor store, and his testimony we expect will be that he saw the victim at the store getting gum on the day of the murder. So that is the witness that we're hearing from at this time. Ask again, Imran Ansari, thank you for being our guest today. So let's talk a little bit more about this case and the circumstantial evidence that they're presenting to try to prove that this defendant did it. Do you think that the 28 years since this crime happened in 1990 is going to affect the ability of the prosecution to effectively show circumstantial evidence beyond a reasonable doubt this defendant should be convicted? Of course. I think the, uh, the passage of time is going to have a real effect on the prosecution's ability to present their case and compel that jury that they have proved this case beyond a reasonable doubt and that Liggins is guilty of the crime. So you have many factors here. You have the passage of time. You have a largely circumstantial case. Uh, and you also have the uh, in lack of availability of witnesses uh, and these readbacks of this testimony from the prior trials. So that's, you know, not only the prosecutions mm -hmm. uh, it goes to the prosecution's uh, Ill, Ill favor, but it also the defense uh, has a big problem with this because you want to have the witnesses for the prosecution in court. You want to have them available for cross-examination. That is extremely important to the defense. So I think the defense will also be having a hard time in terms of handling this trial and having sort of plain, drawn-out testimony read back without the ability to cross-examine these witnesses. And we can't forget that the second uh, uh, appellate reversal of that conviction dealt with the fact that the prosecution failed to hand over, uh, I think, upwards of 75 documents, some of that which was Brady material, which would be material that could, uh, uh, you know, exonerate, would be exculpatory material uh, for the defendant. That wasn't handed over, so the testimony that were, you know, ha is being read back in court, you know, the defense attorney really didn't have a chance to cross-examine these witnesses from some of this material that was now handed over after the fact. So let's talk about that. You know, it sounds like if you hear prosecution hasn't presented or produced like they're supposed to under Brady, 77 pages in this case. To me, that's a pretty flagrant error if you know trial skills and what you're supposed to produce and not, and, and very valid grounds for the decision to be overturned. What do you think of the fact that they did not produce 77 pages that, like you said, could be 
exculpatory in this case? Sure. <clears throat> so myself, I'm a former prosecutor. I now do criminal defense and some civil work. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you're a prosecutor, you know, you're, you're held to that uh, sacred sort of responsibility. Um, now, you know, current trends with Brady material, a prosecutor always hands that over or they're going to have the ramifications on the other side. Um, so in this case, that's a real critical factor here. Uh, that's 75 or 77, uh, you know, pieces of material that was exculpatory to the defendant, possibly that was not handed over. Uh, it's a huge factor in this case. And now both sides are sort of feeling that the prosecution, without live witnesses uh, on their case, and also the defense uh, inability to cross-examine these witnesses uh, on their testimony. So here's what I can't wait to see, and that is the defense and how they utilize those 77 pages that now they do have, and we don't know what evidence might be contained in those but that to me is going to be an exciting part of this trial to see how does the defense utilize that information they now have at their disposal so we are now going to return to Iowa versus Stanley Liggins and continue listening to testimony all right, so that was pre-recorded testimony of the witness Antonio Holmes. Again, he is a witness who was at the liquor store and states that he saw the victim come in to buy gum at the liquor store. And let's talk a bit, a little with my guest again about the actual um, defense objection because they actually made an objection in this case. And so I know you said before, you know, it's a good idea when you have good evidence through the prosecution's questions, you don't need to interrupt necessarily and object. But again, what do you think about the defense objecting along the lines and to any of the the questions asked to the live witnesses. Sure. Uh, you know, it depends what testimony is in the question and, of course, uh, the subsequent testimony with that question. So if there's a, a question presented by the prosecution, which is obviously going to be prejudicial to your client, inappropriate, uh, a leading question, seeking hearsay testimony, uh, you're, not, you're going to object to that. So a skilled defense attorney is going to be able to pick and choose what questions they're going to object to, because especially in this case, again, circumstantial evidence, lack of forensics, uh, you know, a lot of the testimony which is going to be coming out through the prosecution witnesses will be able to be argued on summation that they have improved their case. So it's a, a pick and choose sort of thing. You got to uh, object, obviously, to certain questions. But in a case like this, there's some questions you just want to let ride out in the jury here. And like you said earlier, just to make sure that we understand for the listeners that if you are reading back transcript, you cannot come to any additional objections. You can't make any additional objections. You're tied to the transcript. Is that correct? That is correct. So the defense in this case really has their have their hands tied in a lot of ways. Okay. Which we're going to come back to that and get some more information and we're going to return live to the trial of Iowa versus Stanley Lake. And welcome back. We're listening, listening to live testimony in Iowa versus Stanley Liggins. And you may have heard before we joined that trial that I designated that witness as a criminologist, and I'm quite certain there's no such thing. He's a criminalist, and his testimony was specifically about the car, and this is the defendant's car. So we're going to join our guest because one of the things that I noticed in the testimony on the defendant's car is previously the testimony indicated that the inside of the car was very, very clean and neat. Now we've seen pictures of the trunk of the car, which is not clean and neat. There's all kinds of stuff. How would you argue that as the defense? So as we're listening to the criminalist uh, testimony, <laughs> um, you know, one thing that struck me, you know, the prosecution is going at great lengths to elicit testimony from this witness uh, about the interior of the car, uh, the fact that it was wet, uh, it was moist underneath the seats, and it appeared uh, to be washed, recently cleaned, washed. Um, also, that there was no evidence of rust. So I would imagine the prosecution is going to argue that the evidence shows that it was a recent washing of the interior of the vehicle. However, uh, they went uh, next to the photograph of the trunk, and in the trunk, very uh, prominently, is that gas uh, tank. And now you think about it, uh, the victim was set on fire, she was uh, raped, killed, wrapped in plastic, and set on fire. So we know that there's an accelerant used here uh, to dispose of the body. So you have the interior of the car, which is very clean. Then you have the trunk uh, with this gas canister in there. So if I was the defense, I would be jotting down my notes because on summation, I would be arguing that if the defendant had committed this crime, gone at the great lengths to wash the interior of his car, 
then why wouldn't he dispose of that gas canister? Why would he leave that gas canister in his trunk? It just doesn't make sense. And I would be arguing that the prosecution's case doesn't make sense. It's circumstantial. My client is not guilty. All right, so let's take that in conjunction with the previous testimony again of the criminalist in this case, Dennis Kern, who also testified that they did test the victim's clothing on her um, burned body when she was located, and there was no accelerant that they could identify on those clothes. So as defense attorney, just briefly tell us how would that affect your argument? Well, again, that bolsters uh, my argument estimation uh, based on the evidence because, you know, you have a gas canister there uh, that I imagine that the prosecution is really going to be arguing that, hey, this was the accelerant that was used, yet you have the victim's body uh, has no accelerant evidence on it. So, again, a hole in the prosecution's case, uh, clean car interior, trunk with a canister, why didn't the defendant dispose of that if he was washing the interior of the car? So here's what we're going to have to do in this case is continue to listen to the prosecution and how are they going to put all of the circumstantial evidence together to be able to say to the jury, connect all of these dots and it's clear by uh, beyond a reasonable doubt that this particular defendant killed this nine-year-old, an emotional case given that it is a nine-year-old child. We will be returning live to the trial, but we are going to take a quick break. We hope that you will come back and join us to resume trial in Iowa versus Stanley Liggins. So that was testimony pre-recorded of the defendant's ex-girlfriend, uh, Brenda Adams. And what I want to talk about at this point, and we've been fortunate to have Imran join us. Imran Ansari has been our guest today. And one of the things that I really want to talk about in this case is what compels the prosecution after two failed trials, meaning they had convictions, then they were overturned, to continue with this case and try to get a prosecution, uh, excuse me, a conviction a third time. Sure. <clears throat> well, you have to think about the dynamics here and, and the players, so to say, including the victim. Uh, the victim was a nine-year-old girl. Uh, obviously, this is a smaller uh, community. Uh, there was most likely a lot of outcry. And here you have the prosecution making some serious and egregious errors uh, in the past, right? It's led to two uh, appellate uh, conviction over overturnings. The second one, there were some Brady violations, uh, upwards of 77 documents that the prosecution did not hand over to the defense that could have contained exculpatory material. So some people say, all right, third time, why don't you just drop this prosecution? You made an error on the second round that was pretty egregious. Why don't you just drop it? Well, you really can't. You have a victim. You have a victim's family, people who want to seek justice for that little girl. So it's not as easy as saying, all right, you know what, this is uh, the third time around. Yes, we made some errors in the past. Uh, yes, this individual has been in jail for a, a lengthy amount of time, and, and the defendant hasn't really had justice also. But the prosecution can't just drop a case. They have to go forward with it, a uh, small community and a very sensitive and sympathetic victim here. And this is the man who was also convicted in 1991 of a sexual assault case against another nine-year-old child, a different nine-year-old child. And so when you have a small community who is aware of that conviction from 1991 and a case in which the prosecution state is saying, hey, this is our defendant, he did it, he knew the family, he was there, he was close by, and so we are going to prosecute him because he committed this atrocious, horrific, horrific murder of this child. There was sexual assault according to the prosecution there was also a dousing of the child in gasoline lit on fire and then and died as a result so it's a really a uh, horrific gruesome case with a nine-year-old child I want to thank you Imran you've been a fabulous guest you've jumped right in as we've dissected this trial we hope that viewers will stay tuned with this trial live because it's a fascinating case to see how the prosecution is going to continue to put together all the pieces and give us a good roadmap for the jury to use to try to convict this defendant and to see what the defense is going to bring out of those 77 documents that were not produced in the last trial and will now or have now been produced to the defense. So we are going to return live to the trial to continue coverage. Join us at 1 o'clock for Brian Ross's special 9-11 report.